Hello and welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast with me, your host, Fabio Molle. Every week I speak to the big hitters in the world of tennis, both on and off the court, about the game and how we can all get 1% better every day at what we do. As an ex-national team player, I know exactly how tough this can be. So I'm on a journey to get the very best tips and advice from the world of tennis. Last week on the podcast, we released two episodes. One was an interview with the brilliant Australian coach, Michael Logarzo. In the episode, we discussed the start of Michael's journey in tennis. Michael shared some really valuable tips for how to improve as a coach. And he also told me how you can motivate younger players by making them accountable for their training sessions. We also released a special recorded at the ASIX event in Marbella. In the episode, I spoke with WTA players, Yasmin Paolini, Harriet Dart, and Petra Marchenko, who won the Australian Open girls title last year. They're all part of the ASICS team, and I spoke to all of them about how to get 1% better every day. Make sure to check out those two episodes if you haven't already. This week on Functional Tennis, I'll be speaking with physical trainer and now founder of the tennis tour agency, Matteo Tinelli. Matteo began his life in tennis the same way many of us do, as a player. He was an ATP to a ranked player back in 2017 and has since moved on into becoming a physical therapist and also starting the Tennis Tour Agency. The TTA is an organization that, among other things, wants to make tennis more financially accessible for young players and their families by building a network of coaches and therapists, helping players share travel and coaching costs by coordinating their trips. In today's podcast, we deep dive into the genesis of the TTA and Matteo's vision for going forward. Matteo and I also discuss his early life in tennis, training with greats like Berrettini, and he also shares his advice on managing injury and the importance of prevention over recovery. It's a really valuable chat, but first, let's learn a bit more about Matteo in his own words. Matteo, welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast. How are you? I am great. Thank you, Fabio. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it was great. I met you in Wimbledon last year. You were with Holger and you're with Mike James. So it was great. To, it's great when you meet our guests. I think it adds to the conversation when you've actually met somebody in person. So great to have you on. But let's start. First of all, uh, I was asking before this call, I was like, are you a, a physio, a therapist? I know they're, they're the same, but they're not the same. Tell us exactly what you are right now we're going to get to your past shortly but are you a physiotherapist what is it well i am a muscle therapist let's say i take care a lot of the preventional work uh, with players and uh, also uh, especially manually with uh, manual therapy so you're hands-on you're it's tough work so like a day in your life could be where you're working with a few players and it's all manual manual so it's quite tough on the tomes uh, absolutely absolutely it's uh, it's quite a physical work so let's go back a few years you're initially a player and can you tell us exactly when your tennis journey began for you as a young kid in, where about in Italy? In Milan. I was born and raised in Milan. I grew up with the view of the tennis courts in, right below my window. Uh, so since I was four years old, every weekend I was going to play tennis with my father, who was a former um, table tennis player, professional. Uh, and so he's a tennis fan. And that's how I started. And of course, weekend after weekend, my passion increased. Uh, I started to play every day. So I soon started to play in a club where I stayed the whole life, my whole life, which is uh, uh, called Milago Tennis Academy. And still now, of course, I have a special bond. It's like a second family. Great. And when did, so what were your initial dreams? Like you start playing tennis. When did the dream hit? Like, did you want to be a pro tennis player or who did you look up to? Of course I did. Like, I think uh, every kid plays tennis. Um, I, my two favorite players were uh, Coria and Fognini. Of course, Fognini as an Italian, I cannot, I cannot lie. And uh, I must mention, of course, uh, uh, His Majesty, <laughs> Roger Federer, but he's in a different <laughs> category, of course. Um, well, I believe my ambition was to become uh, um, an Italian flag like Fognini has been for many years and to represent the country in the Davis Cup. That has been my my dream and well I think the biggest one was to win the Italian Open in Rome 
uh, that I think it was uh, I would prefer still now to win Rome other than a Grand Slam. And do you remember the day where you just got serious? You're like, okay, today's the day. I'm raising the bar. I'm all in here. Was there a day like that for you? There was. There was. Um, I was about uh, 14 years old, and uh, in in Italy, like in many countries in Europe, high school puts a lot of pressure to the students, and uh, they were not allowing me to compete and play and travel. So. I remember I had this chat with my parents and I told them I would like to do it properly. I was anyway one of the, let's say, top uh, 10 in Italy of my age. And so my parents, uh, it was a very difficult decision uh, back then, honestly. Uh, But we decided to move the high school to online so I could practice full time morning and afternoon and travel uh, during the year. Still now, I remember how hard the decision was with my family because of course you don't know you're scared of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, but I consider that the best decision I've ever taken in my life. Because uh, I think um, tennis gives you something special. It educates you in a certain way that it makes you live life with different eyes. Okay, yeah, true. And the Italian Training Federation is in Rome, is that correct? It's in Tirrenia, which is a little city in, uh, in Tuscany. Oh, so it's, okay, so it's not so... How far away? Did you train? Did you go there to train or were you working with a local coach? I worked with a local coach and sometimes the, the Italian Federation was asking for me to go there certain weeks per year uh, just to keep track of the improvements. They were giving support, let's say. Okay, and your age group, do we know any other players? Uh, in my age group, there is, well, uh, Berrettini. Okay, w- what was he like... At- what was Berrettini like as a, a young junior? He, well, he has always been a very nice and educated guy. He has always been very hardworking, but he was not a talent that you were looking at him and say, wow, he's going to reach six in the world okay. ATP. Not at all. He was uh, normal. He was uh, top five in his age, but there were many more also that the Italian Federation was uh, betting on, let's say, was uh, sponsoring more. Uh, that we would have thought would have had more chances, more opportunities to reach. So what he achieved, I, I consider him a big example for all the young kids around. And did you play him as a junior? I never did. No, no. Somehow I'm, I never did. But he's one year older. So the guys of my age are uh, Pellegrino and Brancaccio who never reached uh, the top top. They are still 150, 170 around there. And finally on Matteo, why do you think he broke through was it hard work persistence i believe he has a, well he has a big characteristic that many champions have which is when he's supposed to win a match he wins it it has always been like this if you notice if you look all the matches he played where he has to win he wins and of course i believe he's incredibly smart and the hard work he put on uh, he worked a lot when he was a junior, his running was terrible. His back end, also slicing, was not good. Uh, but when you can clearly see the results now, step by step, he improved every year. And uh, I believe his also another big characteristic is he never does uh, the wrong choice. If you if you look, he has uh, of course can be risky his tennis. Sometimes mm. it can go well, sometimes not. But the choice is always the correct one. And on a long match, especially a best of five sets, uh, uh, clearly it pays off. Yeah, no good point on the matches. He wins the ones he w- should win because was it last year at the slams, the four slams, he was only beaten by the top by like Novak, I think. And I can't remember who else, if Rafa was in there as well, but which was, he was only beaten by the top three, which was pr- pretty impressive. Now you could say he should beat them, but uh, that, you know, he's unbelievable. That's a really good point because too many times we lose matches, we should win. And yeah, that that's why some of us aren't so good. But uh, so, so your junior career, you made a big decision when you decided to homeschool and go all in on the tennis. Did you have any other challenges during that young career and how did you overcome them? Well, that's a good question. Um, Of course, in a tennis career, there are so many challenges that a player has to face. Uh, There are plenty. Uh, If I have to choose between all of them, I think the biggest was um, 
the way I was handling the pressure of, uh, you know, there is always that thought behind your head that says, what if I don't make it? What's my plan B? What am I going to do aside from tennis? Because I was, I was a good player, um, but not a world-class talent like uh, Holger Rune or, uh, or Musetti um, or Sinner where, uh, you know, they're supposed to reach the top also at a young age. I was an under ATP at 18 years old. It's a good ranking, but uh, not a champion, you know. So um, at that age, I started to receive many offers from American colleges that were also good. And uh, so it's starting to adding up the, also the financial pressure because the money you spend every year are a lot. And that is um, his offers. And so with my family, um, we decided to go to US also because as soon as I felt the pressure, my tennis level incredibly dropped a lot. So we decided to go to America and pursue a second career. Uh, that, that was a very difficult choice also because it's never easy if you think about it to let go of your childhood dream. And uh, it was a choice made from uh, the brain and not from the heart. So still now, of course, uh, it, I recognize it. Maybe it was correct uh, for my career, but it was difficult. It, it still hurts a little bit, does it? Yeah. And you were quite realistic there. You know, how, how many, does Holger Rune have a plan B? I don't think so. I don't think he needs it. I have to recognize we're talking about totally two different potential. Uh, he, he's incredible. Uh, the day I met him, he was uh, 96, I believe, ATP. I knew he would have reached. And I had an interview already, I think, in half through April, where I said he's going to reach world number one. Where he's going to, was 70. Well, but... Okay, Holger's one example, but there's other players who are top 1,000, you know, 26, 27, and they still don't have a plan B. So you have to have some sort of intelligence or be realistic. I know you don't want to ruin some of these dreams, but it gets to a stage where you need to say, okay, well, what is plan B? At least you were thinking of it, and, you know, it's hard to tell right now, but you probably took the right decision. And you have another career. but So you went to the States. Did you go to university in the States? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a full scholarship in, in a good college specialized in physiotherapy uh, where I studied there. And then I concluded my studies in Milan, in Italy. So did you always, did you always have physiotherapy? Is that what you want? That was plan B from, or did it come when you made that decision? Uh, no, honestly, I, I didn't know what to do because I played tennis all my life. I was always on a tennis court. So it was, a, I remember it was a difficult choice. I didn't know what to do. So I, I started to study finance because my father was, uh, uh, he was working in finance. And then uh, when I reached the States, after literally three months, I had a very bad injury uh, that also left me on a wheelchair for, uh, for 10 days. And uh, I completely changed the course of studies and I started to study physiotherapy because I, I didn't want uh, another player to go through something like that under my, you know, my supervision, of course. So what injury was it? I tore my abs, third grade. Okay. And so you, you think this injury led you to pursue your career in physio? That was your, that was your light, was it? That was your, your star? 100%, yes. Because um, the therapist of the college basically did a wrong diagnosis. He thought it was just a contracture where I actually pulled the muscle and they made me play, and then I taught it. No, so, okay, so you get, so, so you get to university, and you, you get this injury, you're in a wheelchair, and you say, okay, I want to be a physical therapist, and that's what's helped you get to today, is it? J just, you want to help players not get injured, really, be in the best shape. That's why I've always only worked with players, basically. Okay. And so when did you officially retire from tennis? Well, officially, uh, let's say 2016. But after I graduated, I tried to play some tournaments to see where my level was at. And of course, after four years, I, it was uh, quite bad. <laughs> but let's say I tried. Did you realize then I made the right decision? Yes. I mean, I think I realized it. I realized I made the right decision Two years ago when I started to work with several players, that's when I, I knew I was on the right path. Uh, I honestly wanted to retry to play, but uh, I realized that after four years without playing a match, it would have taken too long, too long uh, time 
to to restart to compete at a decent level. So I I I don't I don't think it was worth it, and I started to work full time. And tell me, tennis players, you know, or sport athletes, you would you play tennis at a high level. You were top in Italy as a junior. You obviously have that competitiveness in you, the willing to win. And you didn't play tennis for four years. How did you feed that beast, like the competitiveness inside you? What were you doing to, you know, to get fired up? Well, the dream has never left me. My childhood dream to compete in Rome, to to play in the Davis Cup. So uh, until you stop to dream, you you can enter on court and compete. Uh, tennis has always been my biggest passion. I enjoy to be on court, so. That's why I gave another. I, gave, I tried to give to it another go. Uh, so I really like to compete. I'm a, I, I still see myself as a competitor. So no, so no, so no friendly practice sets with you is what you're trying to say. No, no, <laughs> Not I love table tennis. Holger knows something about it. <laughs> Nice. I'll ask him. I will ask him. And so more recently, you set up the tennis tour agency. I know nothing about that. So maybe you can tell us what is the tennis tour agency? Well, yes, I, it is a new concept. Um, I, I started this company with a friend of mine, um, Alessandro Petrone, who is the coach of Arnaldi. Uh, we started it because I, I saw a very big problem in the tennis world, um, which is most kids, most uh, junior players aren't able to to travel with a coach and when they do the expenses are very high most clubs in europe are not structured to give to the players a coach to travel with for the whole season and so either they travel alone at the age at a very young age like i did at 15 16 uh, or they do with very unqualified coaches which are guys at the first experience uh, with all due respect tennis is a very difficult sport that requires so many different things to reach the top. And I believe to have someone that is qualified and has the, has the right experience, which can either be many years in the tennis industry or at least has lived it in a first person as a professional player is very important. So we have basically uh, two goals. Uh, the first one is uh, um, to provide a coach that can travel for the whole season in order to assist the current team of the player. Okay, so uh, our coach is basically going to be an assistant to the head coach of the player. That's our goal. We don't want to train directly the kid. We would like to put together a group of players that can travel, share the expenses with a coach that will help uh, the head coach and the team that they have back home. Everything in transparency and in complete collaboration. Like a shadow. Absolutely, absolutely. It must work uh, in a... It must be a full collaboration. At a uh, at high level, it's quite normal, uh, but many clubs uh, don't realize it. Maybe they're scared uh, that we want uh, to train their kids full time, but we are not even structured to train them full time. We just provide traveling. So give us a, an example. Let's say a young Matteo, 16-year-old Matteo, plays for his local club in Milan. He wants to, he has a coach, uh, and you want to go play I don't know, you're going to, it's the orange ball season, so you want to go to the States, do three weeks over there. H how would this situation work for a player and parents and coach? So we, there are many different scenarios. I like to think uh, about us that we fix problems. So let's say in your scenario, I am Matteo, I want to go to travel for three weeks in US. Ideally, we will try to put together a team of two or three players that will pl play the same tournaments or travel in the same weeks uh, that, uh, that you would like so that you can share the expenses of the coach. You will travel there with the coach and uh, the, our tennis tour agency coach will have meetings and uh, will uh, talk every day with the head coach of the player back home. Okay, and is there a physio there as well, a trainer, or it's just a coach? That's, that's a, a point I didn't mention. Most our, most our coaches have pursued um, a degree either as a personal trainer, as a physical trainer, or as a therapist. We have okay. currently four coaches that are both national coaches with ATP experience and a therapist that I am currently mentoring. So when you travel, you get a double service. That's actually a good point you make because, you know, coaches are even, let's say without your service, coaches are expensive. The minimum, like, I don't know, a thousand euros a week to travel with a coach. I know it can be more, pay their expenses. 
and a coach can make themselves a lot more attractable if they have those skills, those manual uh, therapist skills, or even if they can strap even they can strap on tape on an ankle. That's an advantage a coach has or can put on some kinesio tape or absolutely. And tell me how's how's business going? Is it going good? Well, um, as I told you before, it's a new concept. So I believe it will take a while to be fully understood. Um it's not going bad. we we're having many requests. Um we should be starting properly from uh, January to organize many travels. And if you're to look back, let's say in five to ten years' time, look back at TTA, what would make it a success for you? Well, my ambition is uh, to make like life easier for everyone. Uh, I would like at least to know everyone to know that TTA exists, is there, and that our goal is uh, just to provide a high qualified and affordable team, so they can continue to progress. I think Matteo's ambition for the TTA is really valuable and needed in tennis. Sport is all about fair competition, especially for younger players, and the financial cost of pursuing your dreams can rob the players with the highest potential of this opportunity. So organizations like the TTA are really important. This is just a quick reminder you listen to Functional Tennis, the podcast that helps you get 1% better every day. With me, Fabio Molle. Coming up, Matteo explains how he felt as a member of Holger Rune's team at Roland Garros after Holger suffered a an injury to his ankle. Matteo also gives his advice on how players can come back from difficult injuries like the one Holger endured. But before that, I want to get Matteo's thoughts on overtraining. Matteo, like you're working with it, you work with a lot of players, you're you know, you get to see players who, you know, are feeling injury or injured or feeling strains. Overtrain in the world of tennis, is it a big problem? It is. It is absolutely one of the biggest issues. Uh, the main one is because the season is so long. It's uh, 11 months old and uh, players have to travel and compete for all the year, also with intercontinental flights. So the effort that we ask to the body is huge. So uh, my usually the advice I give to my players, the first one is very uh, easy. You hear it often, but I think it's very important to listen to the body carefully because it sends us signals, signals and uh, most of the times uh, players go through tournaments with a few dis- dis- um, dysfunctions. So it's very important to take initiative and keep them under control. Prevention, I always say, is better than healing, right? So if you play matches with small dysfunctions, um, and maybe they can be tough, uh, they can easily get under, uh, out of control. So um, I believe it's, it's a key to take the problems when they're still small, and fix them. Uh, another, I think, key part of having an healthy season is to make several training blocks during the year um, so that you can heal the body, keep working on it, and keep improving. Uh, I, I think, personally, my ideal scenario would be to do two or three tournaments in a row and then stop for 10 or 14 days to train. And in this way, you keep improving in a healthy way and the risks, uh, the risks of getting injured are reduced. And what do you say then to the the players who, you know, di- we're in December now, you could say they're in the middle of pre-season or they should be taking some time off, that are busy in in uh, the Middle East earning some good money. Do you think, okay, well, it's good money, it's not going to last forever? Or do you think, no, why don't you just take a break? Well, uh, I believe it, it really depends on the also financial situation of the players. But... Uh, I think off season is meant to save time and work on yourself. Um, if you're able to do these exhibitions, earn good money, and in the meanwhile keep training hard physically so that you're ready for January, then it's okay, absolutely. But if you keep playing exhibitions like uh, one exhibition per week and you never have the time to stop and train, then I think it's it's a little risky. Also because you start the year with uh, a big tour de force with uh, uh, Australia, that takes usually five weeks. Uh, then you have uh, either uh, South America or uh, the tour in Europe. It's basically, and then you have Miami and Indian West. It's basically three months with no bad time off. I think all this requires consistency. Uh, you know, just showing up every day, doing your rehab work every day. How do you encourage, especially young players, 
to do their to do their prehab every day to say, look, this is really important. You may not need it today, but when you're 28, 32, all this prehab will help so much. And plus, you're instilling this routine in them that, look, you just got to do this. How do you convince your players you have to do this? That's a good question. Well, when you work with someone young, uh, I think, because at the end of the day, prevention work uh, is quite boring. It's not fun for a guy. A guy wants to hit the balls, run, uh, maybe play soccer. Okay, so you have to try to make to make it a little fun that so the time passes for them. Of course, if we're talking with players, professional players, they understand it and they commit. So with them, it's quite easier. Uh, but I think... Uh, when you have a player at a young age, it's important to teach them that um, discipline is small things like prevention, nutrition, or fitness uh, can compensate the absence, of, the absence of talent, okay? But talent cannot be compensated by the absence of discipline. If you think about it, you can also be Roger Federer with the talent, talent-wise. Uh, but if you show up to practice once a week, you don't do prevention and get injured every month, you will never reach the top. So on the other side, uh, if you play a healthy season, if you practice every day and you get better that one little step, that 1% every day, like Berrettini, like Sonego did, uh, you can get actual results on the long run. Yeah, no, you need that consistency. And tell me, were you part of Team Holger at Roland Garros? I was, I was, yes. It has been a great run. I saw the photos of his ankle where, was it, it was heavily swollen. It was like a, a football there. It was, it was. How did he play through that? Like, did, I don't think he could even flex his ankle. He couldn't. He he pulled the ligament of the ankle. So the doctors at the tournament uh, advised him also not to play. Um, I believe he could. We we worked very, very hard to recover. It happened on the second round with Laxonen. And uh, the, the ankle was literally like a balloon. Uh, I worked on it with him, of course, around uh, 10 hours the day after. And uh, we, we did machines, ice, uh, drainage, drainage massage, uh, bandages. We really tried uh, everything we could. In fact, when he played against uh, Gaston on the first game, the ankle still had to loosen up a little bit. Uh, and he was struggling, but I have to recognize that he has been tough. Matteo, as as a physical therapist sitting in the box watching Holger with a heavily strapped ankle and a ballooned ankle that you know how serious it was, how did you feel in the box? <laughs> well, I remember for the first 15 minutes, I was very nervous because uh, I also I took a risk to make him play like that. Uh, we've worked extremely hard um, around 10, 10, 11 hours for two days in a row to make him play. And uh, I knew he could have played, but, you know, deep down, you're always tight. And uh, at the beginning, I remember Gaston was hitting hard at his forehand and the ankle was uh, troubling him. I-, I could see it. He didn't want to run very much. And so there I, w- I, got, I got very nervous. But the more he went on, uh, the better he got. And, so, and also he managed to get through, which was an incredible performance also because there was all the crowd against him. Uh, it looked like a soccer match, basically. So, um, yeah, it was a, a very big uh, satisfaction to see him win the match. Maybe the crowd helped. Yeah, no, he got pumped a lot for the crowd. Yes, it did help. Well, w- well, well done there. I don't know how much work went into that. Your job, again, you come across players when they're injured, more so probably when they're injured than the prehab. Uh, ha- ha- how do you help them? psychologically return back to the court after serious injury to build up that confidence i know we do the i know you do the hands-on stuff they may work with a trainer to you know for exercise but from the cycle psychological side of how do you help players get the confidence to get moving you know and forget about the injury well it's never easy to come back after an injury um because most players and teams are in a hurry they are rushing to come back on court because there is a lot of points every week. Uh, there is a lot of money. And so they try to skip the steps. But when it comes to an injury that uh, doesn't allow a player to play, uh, there is a biological time that it needs to be respected to recover, right? So 
the first thing to do is to respect the, the biological time. That, uh, that must be done. But what I think gives a lot of security, both to the whole team, is uh, to understand why the injury occurred. Every injury occurs for one reason. If you fix that reason, the injury will not, will not come back, of course, if you respect the biological time, of course. So I believe if a player knows that you fixed the main reason why the injury occurred, he will come back on court a little more confident. And you, you talk about, you know, respecting the biological clock and that requires a lot of patience. How do you get them to be patient? You know, these are highly tuned athletes with a lot of, you know, they want to get out there and play. How do you actually convince them to say, look, slow down here? I give them treats, um, you know, like you do with, uh, with, uh, with dogs. Basically, I, I allow them to do light things on court. For example, I make them play without moving or I make them play with uh, the hand fed or uh, just with basket drills, uh, slow steps. But I don't also, I am not a therapist that, that uh, likes the absolute rest. I always try to make them move as much as possible because movement is the key to recover. So, and I also know as a former player how tough it is when you lose the, the feeling with the ball. So I always try to make them somehow hit a few balls per day. So that doesn't keep them too far away from the court and uh, their, their mind remains more empty. Nice. You stop them from exploding. And, and players who, you might have some players who get, you know, injured from time to time, small niggles, and they may get upset about it. And, you know, you have to be persistent. All great champions are persistent. How do you instill those values in players or do you think it comes directly from the player it's not your job to do that well uh, i think patience is uh, is quite a big deal in this sport right because uh, especially in the modern uh, days a career can last for 16 years from the age 18 until 34 so if you work hard every day if you do everything properly if you're able to compete with consistency for a whole season and of course, there is the quality of the player, but when they reach the top, the quality there is, the results will come. The career will for sure get better. So I also think uh, showing up every day makes the, um, the process more enjoyable, more satisfying. It, it satisfies the player more because uh, they will get better results. And also I think that to perform at a high level, uh, you need many combinations. Um, as I mentioned, of course, uh, good tennis level, you need um, a solid and healthy body that doesn't just get injured, but also performs well. Uh, you need emotional intelligence that is very underrated, mental strength, and uh, also a good knowledge of the game. Interesting. That's why the peak of a player in ATP comes at 27 years old, 26, 27. Yeah, that's a, an interesting point you make. I did hear before that they often said these great champions, Nadal, more so Nadal in this case, I'm referring to was at 18. They said, look, his mental intelligence is of a 28 year old. You know, he was mentally, now Federer probably came a bit later, but, and the rest, but they say, it's a good point you make that, yeah, the mental intelligence and the, uh, emotional intelligence is is really important it's incredibly important not just in tennis but in the everyday life uh, imagine playing a, a full match where you are rational about your emotions the emotions of the player of, of your opponent uh, about what's going on every point taking the right decisions taking the right time between points it changes completely the whole game and what where do you think that emotional intelligence come from? Does it come from a strong, healthy family background? Does it come from players reading? Does it come from the environment they're in? It could be a mix of these, but in your experience, where do you think, and the players you've seen with this emotional intelligence at a young age, where do you think that's fostered? Well, of course, uh, uh, a well and structured family helps, but I think emotional intelligence, um, it's just like the, the normal IQ. Um, sometimes there are people who maybe, let's say, are born with it, but most of them work hard on it. They work hard on knowing themselves, of uh, trying to understand uh, the, the way the world works. So I believe it comes to open our mind and um, uh, study our inner thoughts, our emotions, be mindful 
So I believe, for example, like I mentioned before, I think Berrettini is a very good example of a person who is uh, very highly emotional intelligence. Yeah, nice. And yeah, no, I really think that's an important thing that's not talked about enough. But moving on to you, what are your future plans? Obviously, we have the TTA. Will we ever see a return to the tennis court? Or what's your goals for the future, Matteo? Well, my comeback on court is quite unlikable, honestly. <laughs> uh, no, my, my goals are uh, firstly to finish my degree in um, sports psychology that I started to study four years ago. I'm about to finish. And then I'd like to, of course, keep helping players to keep them healthy and to compete. So I'd like to stay on tour and travel just like I've been doing the past two years. And uh, of course, um, I'll focus on tennis tour agency. I'd like it, as I told you before, to be known. Uh, to be known and, know, and make people understand that we are there to help. And lastly, uh, I'll be working in my studio. I opened a studio in Milan recently. So I have a collaborator and we are both uh, specialized in tennis. So that will take for sure a big part of my focus. Great. Congrats on the studio. I know that's a big move. So that's good. And finally, what advice do you have for players who want to be 1% better every day? So, well, my first advice is uh, to have fun and enjoy the journey and the sport. If you do it, it's easier, by far easier, to give 100% every day. You know, it doesn't have to be a sacrifice. Secondly, I, I believe and I have seen that keeping people close to you that care about you and your development matter a lot. They keep you on track. They'll tell you always things honestly. And if you look at the top, so many people kept the same team for most of the career. And well, lastly, I would say to keep the standards high. Always keep the standards high. The goal must be high. And then you reach them with small steps. Thank you. That's that's very great advice. Thank you very much, Matteo. Great chatting to you. And best of luck with the TTA traveling and your new studio. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck to you as well. I think that's probably a wrap on today's episode. Special thanks to Matteo for coming on the podcast. I love what you're doing with the TTA and I'm excited to see how it develops in the future. Next week on the podcast, I'll be meeting Bill Ekstrom, founder of Excel Sports. In our chat, Bill shares a compelling theory that the key to getting results in sport may be more down to building strong relationships rather than skill development. It's a fascinating episode, so we'll see you there next week. Just a few quick notes before we go. Make sure to follow the show so you get automatically notified about new episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. If you would like to learn more about me or the work we do at Functional Tennis, visit our website at functionaltennis.com. You can also follow the show on Instagram at Functional Tennis Podcast and with me on Twitter, Fab Mall. This podcast is produced by One Fine Play. James Bishop is the executive producer. Connor Foley is the series producer. Kazra is our superb audio engineer and editor. I've been your host, Fabio Molly. Thanks for listening to the Functional Tennis Podcast. Oh.